Lisa McInerney is a literary phenomenon. She's from Galway, but she's an adopted Carcone. We're definitely claiming as one of our own. She's a novelist, a short story writer, and essayist. Her work is featured in Winter Papers, The Stinging Fly, The Guardian, The Mond, Grantha, BBC Radio 4, and many other outlets. Her short story navigation was long listed for the 2017 Sunday Times EFG Short Story Award. Other short stories of hers have been anthologized in Being Bearers, which I think is on sale outside, in I Am Heathcliff, in Repeat Eighth, in The Long Gaze Back, and in Town and Country, New Irish Short Stories. Lisa's debut novel, The Glorious Heresies, was published in 2015, won the 2016 Bailey's Women's Prize for Fiction, and the 2016 Desmond Ellie Prize. It was shortlisted for an Irish Book Award and longlisted for the 2016 Dylan Thomas Award. This second novel, Blood Miracles, was published in 2017. It was joint winner of the 2018 RSL Encore Award and was longlisted for the 2018 Dylan Thomas Prize. Lisa's books have been translated into French, in which she won a literary award, Italian, in which she won another literary award. <laughs> Spanish, Dutch, German, Czech, Serbian, Polish, and Danish. And when I was reading that list, I really had to smile because I was thinking of those poor Czech and Serbian translators. some of the dialogue of these books. Quaint, hard phrase, phrases like, he's so gold, <laughs> or I will be whole. <laughs> so I don't know how they manage it, but I uh, hope they did. Lisa has taught in the NUI Galway and Main Creative Writing Course, and she is currently a contributing editor in the Stingy Fly magazine. She will be editing a special issue of the magazine next year in partnership with the Galway 2020 European Capital of Culture Programme. Colin Barrett said that the Blood Miracles has all the brio, street smarts, and vicious linguistic verb of the glorious heresies, but with this follow up, Lisa McInerney also reminds us just how brilliantly accomplished and ruthlessly focused a storyteller she is. Ladies and gentlemen, Lisa McInerney. I'm too Irish to listen to that kind of thing. <laughs> Actually, um, at the moment, the second novel has been translated into Italian, and the poor fellow who's doing it today, he emailed me going, what's a ball hopper? I'm going to read a bit from the, the short story, which has nothing to do with Cork. It's in Being Various, and it's, it's called Gerard, and it's, it's a bit of a strange one. Um, as it happened, when Lucy Caldwell, who is the, the editor for, of this, was putting together this collection. She emailed me and she said, would you send me a short story? And I had something that I had written and I'd spent months on it. And it just, it wasn't really coming together. I think it's a novel, it's not really a short story, but I sent it to her and I said, look, I also wrote this other thing as a, as a kind of a funny thing, as a joke um, for a friend. And you can kind of read that too if you want. And unfortunately that's the one she chose to put in here. So this is really, really stupid and I'm sorry um, before you start. But anyway, this is a little bit of Gerard. Our friend C told us she had started seeing legendary French actor Gérard Depardieu. <laughs> Naturally, this surprised us to the extent that we assumed she was lying to us or had suffered some sort of catastrophic mental break. C was born in 1991. We learned that Gérard Depardieu was born in 1948. The only thing you could say of that really is that they were both post-war babies. <laughs> of course, then we had to argue over what was meant by post-war. War was a capital W. We decided World War, though then it was pointed out that there was always a war going on somewhere, which made us mope. C. and Gerard Depardieu had created temporal chaos and overlapping of incongruous time frames. We doubted ourselves. We furrowed our brows and scratched our upper arms. C. had moved to Paris that April, though she did not speak a word of French. We did not know this until after she had gone. We had assumed that she had privately learned to speak French, because how could you presume to live in Paris without speaking French? The French had a reputation for being hostile towards English-speaking monolinguals. We thought one would have to be extremely mad to move to France without being able to speak French. We learned this about C when she mentioned that she was looking for a waitressing job, and we asked how confident she was of being able to deal with customers. Did she know the correct culinary terms? How would she deal with complaints or large groups insisting on splitting the bill? 
she blithely said she had no French at all. In fact, she could not even say, Désolé, je ne parle pas le français. One should at least have enough of a language to admit to being inept. We were adamant that was the bare minimum in terms of self-respect and respect for the foreign other. C wasn't troubled by that kind of thing. C was very rarely troubled by the kinds of things that caused us, us to mop our foreheads or sprout hives. We assumed that C assumed all of our customers at the cafe would be English speakers. In fact, that they would be more comfortable speaking English than French. We assumed that C assumed that she could find a job bringing sad, milky coffees to Britons and Americans. Else her intent seemed a little arch. And we disagreed with archness in every respect. We wouldn't be like C to be arch. Gerard de Perdue spoke English, we learned, but not well. We read an interview with him from 2011, in which he stated that he understood English far better than he spoke it, though he spoke it in a rather slapdash way that further galvanised the hypothesis that he was mad as a sack of ferrets. We imagine C speaking with Gerard de Perdue, in her in wily hiberno-English, him in excited malapropisms, constantly misunderstanding each other, they would find it hard to argue because they would not be able to correctly state their stances. Their conversations would be characterised by frustrated gestures. Possibly, Gerard Depardieu was being truthful when he told his interviewer that he understood much better than he spoke. And so possibly, he thought of C as a sort of zippy innocent. Possibly he was toying with her. We did not like this idea and cursed Gerard Depardieu and swore never to give him the benefit of doubt on this or on further issues. It occurred to us that such a language barrier might be exploited by someone who was not, in fact, legendary French actor Gérard Depardieu. And after all, we were, all of us young, and see particularly blithe. Therefore, was it not possible that she was not au fait with the output, reputation, or indeed visage of legendary French actor Gérard Depardieu, and so open to the machinations of imposters? C told us not to be stupid. She had vetted Gérard Depardieu thoroughly. We had to admit that this was somehow more likely, because even though C was very blithe, she was also very clever. You're so ridiculous, she told us. There is nothing at all wrong with dating Gérard Depardieu. You are acting as if dating Gérard Depardieu is a terrible thing. It's at least ill-advised, we said. I'll leave it there. <laughs> Lisa, left us hanging for more. <laughs> Colin Cregan. Colin Cregan is a living legend of Cork literature. He was born and raised and still lives in the heart of Cork City, only a pot father from here over in Devonshire Street. Colin is a short story writer, novelist, playwright, and documentary filmmaker. Colin's stage plays include When I Was God, The Trial of Jesus, Glory Be to the Father, The Cure, and After Luke. These plays have been produced and performed many times in Ireland and abroad over the last 20 years, and the cure is due for another run in New York City in November this year. These plays have also been nominated for and won several awards. Cullen has written over 60 hours of radio drama, and his work has been commissioned and broadcast by RTE, BBC Radio 4 and BBC World Service, and by radio stations in Australia, Hong Kong, New Zealand, Canada and the USA. He has written and produced many documentaries and films. Cullen's short stories have achieved recognition in several literary awards and have been broadcast on RP radio, adapted for stage, and published extensively in various periodicals and collections in Ireland, UK, Germany, and China. And there's more. Cullen's published books <laughs> include Panto and Let the Right Out, a collection of short stories, Passion Play, a novel. Second City Trilogy, a trilogy of plays which is due to be re-released later this year, and The Immortal Deeds of Michael O'Leary. His novel, Be Got Not Made, was published in 2018. Be Got Not Made was a finalist in the Next Generation Indie Book Awards, long-listed for the Not the Booker Prize Awards, and was shortlisted in the United States Annual Book Awards. His fiction has been translated into Italian, German, and Bulgarian, with extracts published in Chinese. Which makes me think of the expression, don't your boy, <laughs> which I don't know how the Chinese are going to deal with. Because don't your boy is a very important character in the book we got not made. He's a pigeon, he's a cock pigeon. In 2016, 2017, Cormac was writer in residence in University College Cork. And in 2017, he was appointed adjunct professor of creative writing in the School of English in UCC. 
the New York Times said, as written by Cormac Creedon, such moments resound with the once inducing authenticity before they are eclipsed by an inspirational twist. Words soar like a bracing breeze over the River Lee. Ladies and gentlemen, Cormac Creedon. I was afraid you were going to read out me to start that. <laughs> <laughs> I always feel like a bit of a fraud when they read when I say that they read their biography because, like, I don't know, I suppose they could wallpaper small hooks with rejection slips and things that never really happened and things that were disastrous. So thank you for picking the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read a story, and but that's a, a start, middle, and the end. You know, uh, there's two choices. One is the most recent one that will be published in a few months' time in Loa University in the States, or it's the other one is my first short story. It's very clunky and a bit all over the place, but because I said it's my first one, I, I might read. Read them. Right? Yes, yes. Okay, but it's a bit. Okay, there's one for a vote, and then there's one for the second vote. <laughs> So I put Mary in the bath, she's the queen, as you know, right? <laughs> okay. I run it anyway, right? And I go really quick. And it is a bit clunky because it's uh, about 1989 in a row, right? So at the time, not only did I not write, I couldn't read either, right? So it's still a process when you get there, right? Here goes. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> it's very stressful, it's easy to read, right? So you can sit there. <clears throat> Down our street, change comes slowly. So slow, it's undetectable. Undetectable like ageing, yet inevitable. Some things never change. As usual, there's Jojo Duggan standing at the far side of my shop counter, snatching a free read of a debt notices and the evening paper before he heads home for the tea. Outside, traffic is thick, spluttering heavy metals that make way up to the first floor of windows and stick like tar. Through my shop window, I see frustrated faces facing home and no move in the traffic. Busy out there, says I've been hoping for compensation. Nothing about that, says he. This street was asked to know the locks in Viking times. Outside, I see a driver abandoning the gridlock. Hazards flashing, he makes a beeline for the shop. The doorbell announces his arrival, his eyes scowl the cigarette shelf. Uh, fags, a pack of them there, he points. It crossed my mind that here's a man who's been battling the cigarettes and I'm witnessing his most recent bravery. Shocking out there, says I. Shocking? Diafucking bollock. <laughs> this street was always diafucking bollock that Jojo throws into a bloody bottleneck, he snaps, and struggles to get a cigarette from packet to mouth, while ranting on about two lanes coming into three and a cross plague of four by fours or something like that. I take his money, say thanks, and send him on his way. Traffic has moved a couple of feet up the street, horns honk, fists flake the air, the cigarette smoker slips into his car apologetically, drives a couple of feet and stops, still going nowhere, just ticking over. It crosses my mind that maybe this street was ass to nose with ox in Viking times, but it wasn't always that way. So I turn to Jojo and say, would you believe that we played eight-a-side soccer up and down that street without interference from the traffic and that wasn't the dark ages? He wouldn't play picking up their nose, is he? And with a flick of his wrists, he's trolling through the small ads. I make my way towards the window and look out at the insanity of it all. Maybe it's a curse of middle age, but for some reason, through the car exhaust and dusty haze, I'm transported from another time. It was a long time ago, 30, 40 years ago or so. It was a time when we were buttoned up in the days before Velcro. It said there's no life without light, but down our street there was no light without life. Even the dullest of street lamps had a cluster of people. They chatted, they sang, they shouted, they fought, they made love, and then they went home. And every day after school, the downtown dirty face would gather like moths to a flame. You'd find us there funding a ball up and down the road, shouting, rolling, red-faced. The stretch of city street between the old bakery and the gate next to my father's shop was our stadium. And with every goal, foul, or near miss, the roar of the crowd echoing inside our heads would erupt with a oh to the sound of the cop, north bank, 
Strefford Inlet. It's about quarter past four, cold smoke fills the air, sky dark, street light dimly lit. The clock is ticking and it's getting late. I stand up from the curb, trying to go home and say, Will someone call up to Georgie's house and get the ball? Look, there's nobody, his man got the ball, old Georgie. Will someone call up to house and get Georgie? So, will you? <laughs> Hang on, I think I see some. There he is, that's it, and there's Georgie's. Turning the corner of Brewery Lane, ball under his arm, and trailing behind him his small brother, Polly. Hi, hey, Georgie, come on, we're going to kick it in, we're going to kick it in. Georgie hears us, but he's still out of range. He walks out into the middle of the street, raises his fingers of judging the air direction. One slick swoop, the ball slips from under his arm onto his outstretched left hand, his pace quickening to a trot. Ball drops and without missing a beat, he gives it a little lash. Like a rocket, it vanishes into the darkness, way above the street lamps. On the head, lay it on, chip it in. Quick tap around, team is picked. And the game was on. There was an uneven number of us that evening, so Georgie's small brother, Polly, was once again the floater. Now, like a floater, a floater was there to even the odds. So, in the event of a goal, he had to endure the indignity of changing sides to play with the losing team. And there was something pathetic to see him turn around and play for the losing side while his ex teammates jumped and howled to the rope and crowd. Like, what a way to start life. Always on the losing side, always the reject. That was small party, a bar loser. Each night he'd be able to spend the whole game running his little hat up or even the smell of the ball, except when it went wide and ended up miles off down the street. Small party was always the one who'd run after it. Anything, anything for a touch of the ball. It's come to us, the Angeles, the score is 14 0. The women in the street are calling us in for our team. It's time to call it a night. Up goes the shout, next goal wins, the rule is on, the ball is out, the pressure is off, all men forward, both sides play attacking defence, and after 28 goals, root roaring and rattling the back of the onion sack, the next goal is the only goal that counts, a quick break, a clatter of sparks from quarters, roaring, backward running, short tugging, shoving, a rocket sends the pigskin squealing, two inches wide of the post, spinning the strap of into their toes, oh! Ball is out, and now Kieran says a fight to the left, stride the midfield to the ring, opening a gap in the hole. George makes a break along the side, playing the ball off the high foot path, he weaves inside the mark, the park Morris minor. He beats one, he beats two, he shoots, keeper sent full stretch to keep it out of the net, then knocks it down to the halfway line. It's intercepted, sent back in, picked up by George, and George is on the ball, the ball is at his feet, and he's tumbling down the ring. Small parties at the far side of the open goal. Georgie, pass the ball, Georgie, pass the ball, Georgie, pass the ball to me. Georgie sees his kid brother waving frantically and calling for the ball. Maybe it's because Small Party has two left feet. Or maybe it's because Georgie is a glory hunter, whatever the reason. That split of a second, he decides to go it alone. He takes a crack. Ball screws off his boot, clips the footpath, spins in the air, bounces out wide. Keeper leaves it off. The coffin full of boys chant of frustration. Georgie was super spy. He walks like a woman and he wears a bra. From nowhere comes small party. His little legs like pistons, knees pumping under short pants. His right foot reaches out awkwardly, left shin drawing blood as it scrapes down the road. Ball connects with party's ankle. It rebounds off the curb and bounces. Party tumbles over flat in his face. Sprawled out there on the road, the ball bounces, spins, and bounces again. Keeper's caught flat footed. He can do nothing but watch as the ball bounces just beyond his reach into the goal. Goal, 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 and the word goal echoes across the street from gate to gate and around the stadium. The cop in all its glory is under fire. Give him a ball in the air, the grass party leave you on your ass. Cody's eyes are bulging his head and stretched out there in the middle of the street, he raises his arms above his head in the V for victory. Cody's on his feet. He makes a dash inside the keeper, picks up the ball, waves his right hand to the invisible crowd behind the goal. He hears them call out his name and chanting, Nice one, Polly, nice one, son, nice one, Polly. He jumps in the air, shaking his little clenched fist. This is Polly's night, his moment of glory. Not only has he scored the winning goal, but the game is over. He can't be sent to the losing team. So <laughs> Polly has won the game. Georgie runs up behind his baby brother, ropes his fellow like care with a father like pride. Don't you, Polly, boy? Small Polly is peeking. He remembered this goal for the rest of his living days, but right now all he wants to do is get home to tell his dad. 
Them two party boys, says George A. Glenn, sorted Georgie, sorted, party gives a thumbs up, and he's off in a lap of honor. Three foot two, eyes of blue, party bookies after you, and we love him, we love him, we do. <laughs> it came from nowhere. To the sound of screeching brakes and the smell of burning rubber, we just stood there, unable to move, hopelessly headless, unable to do anything but look on horrified as two tons of rubber and steam just chewed up small body, spattering concrete and tarmac, crushing schoolboy skull and bones to ashfield. Georgie cradled his baby brother's mangled body under the eminence, prized a little corpse from his arms, and kneeling there in the middle of the street, Georgie wept. Georgie was never the same after that. I have vague memories of neighbours in the street with prayers and tears, and maybe we didn't understand the meaning of a closed casket funeral. All I know is that I never saw Polly again. Polly, the floater, was gone. Georgie's family moved out of our streets soon after that. The rest were to follow. And of all the boys who played ball that evening, only one remains living in our street, and that's me. And maybe I don't remember some of their names, but I've lived with each and every one of their dirty faces etched indelibly in my brain. It was a day I remember vividly. It was the day we lost the game. The day street soccer became a thing of the past. The day small party died. It's dusky outside. Traffic has moved a few feet up the street. Jojo folds the newspaper as neat as he can and places it back under the bundle on the counter. It's almost six o'clock. He's heading home to catch the news on the telly. I was just reading there, says he, uh, the council are talking about pedestrians tonight in this street. This street, says I. Says in the paper, they want to attract families back into the inner city, says he. And as George has spoke some dominant book about the inner city rejuvenation, it crossed my mind that people who live here never call it the inner city. It's always just plain downtown. And when you hear the word in the city, it usually means that the developer's ball is not far behind. It'd be nice, wouldn't it, he says. It'd be nice to have a place pedestrianised. I'm tempted to say that this street was pedestrianised long before there was traffic on it, but I just didn't have the heart to get in all that. So I said, yeah, Jojo, you're right. It'd be lovely. A few flower pots, benches, that sort of thing. Jojo shoves his lunchbox inside his coat and heads off into the dark, home to his gas, coal effect, fire and telly. I watch him cross the street, weave in and out through the traffic and pass over beyond the lane where Georgie used to live. Somehow I know, pedestrianisation or not, football will never be played in our street again. The families are gone, never to return. They have moved out to the corporation reservations on the north side, out of the heart of the city. I remember the day a small party died. It was the day street soccer became a thing of the past. It was the day, it was the day the traffic won the game and the heart of a city stopped beating. That's it. Thank you very much. Outstanding. Oh, yeah. Thanks very much. Um, what you said a little bit first about the commonality between both your writings, I think, um, and actually the, the team of your sort, they're talking kind of covered at a certain month. Last night there was a talk about class in the in the writing of one of the sections, and about middle class in particular and kind of privilege. But you say you've written an essay, a very brilliant essay, called Walking Class and Escape Manual, and um, your folks. I mean, I don't know if, if this is fair. I have working class sensibilities. Right about the working class menu. Is that simplistic? Is it reductive? Or is it, is it something you even think about? Well, no, I, I do think about it. It's kind of, um, it's one of these things I think uh, I've come across people kind of um, characters more than actual writers, characters in various stories and stuff who are kind of have to be informed that other people don't think they're good enough or that they're not. Um, quite fitting into the society they're trying to fit into. And it makes me laugh because I'm like, I have never in my life ever been in any doubt that I'm a complete scoby. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it's like you don't have to be told you're working class. You just, you, you know, you know you're not the same as the thing and you know your house doesn't look like this house and you know all of these things. So, I mean, 
naturally it kind of comes through in the writing. It's not necessarily something where you go, I must write a tract about working class life. You know, it's, it's, it's not that. It's just that this is the place where my, my typing fingers tend to go. This is the kind of story that comes out because these are the lives that I'm familiar with. And it's not a case of me trying to trying to kind of represent something because that's the other thing that's kind of leveled at me quite a bit too are you trying to represent kind of these characters that don't otherwise have voices I'm like no I didn't think of it that way either it's just this is just this is just who I am so yeah. is that the same for you Conan? I mean that story you know is about inner city is, is kind of as about majority do you even think about that? Uh, well I suppose I'm better off wrote this way um, I suppose realistically that was the first way I ever wrote right? and it's actually sort of true you know so it wasn't really Trying to write the except that I was just sitting there and write, writing. And uh, in fact, the mad thing about it is that, uh, like, the, the, the guy, the older brother, right, he was in school with me, right, uh, John Cal, right? And um, the mad, like, when you're writing these things, you're not writing them to, thinking of an audience or even thinking of publication, you're just writing them, writing the lottery and bags, and whatever, right? In fact, I used to get them typed around the corner and um, the secretary of school, I used to play them for somebody else. I say, uh, could I hand them in there? My buddy checked them. Then I say, he never checked them. I checked them. Eventually, eventually, they got wise to the fact that it was me because the spelling was always oh, bad. And they said, uh, you know, oh, the first review was like, oh, I didn't like that one. Oh, the other one was And uh, But the mad thing is that, like that, you don't really ever expect it to go beyond your piece of paper. And I'd say about 15 years ago, I got into a cab on Curtin Street, and who was there driving my John Cat? And, I was thinking, that first thing, oh Jesus Christ, because that was on the radio, and I said, like, God, I hope God didn't offend them, right? And he just said, uh, uh, I read the story, so I knew exactly what he was talking about, and uh, I was saying, uh, you know, was your mother okay about it? And she, he said that it was in Pancho and Lifter, he says, mm -hmm. she has the book up next to the photograph. Oh. So I thought it was okay then, and I was at it, I, if I can, I think I was getting a taxi up to Tom Barry's, because I used to drive, get a taxi up and walk home, right? It was easier. And, uh, <laughs> was, uh, home, right? and um, it took about four days to get home. So, uh, uh, he never took money for it, so I thought, okay, what's person? But so, no, I wouldn't be thinking of really anything deeper than just telling the story of the characters, whatever, yeah. you know? Yeah. And another thing that you have in common is it's such a strong sense of place. And um, that certainly came to light in your story there, Colin, and, and in your novels too, Lisa. And I think you bring it to life, Lisa, in particular, proposing with the vernacular, with the kind of dialogue, with the way people speak. I mean, is it something you really work with, Lisa? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I, I think that this. Well, I was going to say especially in Ireland, but that's not true because every every country is like this. But obviously, if as an Irish person, I'm going to pretend that only Irish people do this. But especially in Ireland, the way we talk, you know, we get to know each other purely through conversation. And it's not just the things that are said, it's how they're said and the things that are left out. And it kind of becomes this thing you navigate as well. And it's really, that's what I want to capture. I, I, like, I often get to the end of kind of this particular brilliant scene that I've written, it's, it's incredible altogether and you know I got to, I, you get to the end of it and there's two characters and they're bouncing off each other and there's some great lines and chat and all this and at the end I've kind of realised I've forgotten to actually put them somewhere and that um, we don't know are the inside or the outside, uh, what's the space like, you know I'm very very bad at physical places, they're kind of things I have to kind of really think about. I don't have to think about conversation or writing the vernacular because I mean I think with, with, with Ireland with Hiberno English and especially with Cork English, it's it's just so rich and interesting. And the way Irish people say things in comparison to, you know, I mean, like we don't say, like, listen to me now, I'm not saying something in 10 words if I can possibly say it in 110 words. Do you know what I mean? So there's an awful lot of kind of bouncing back and forth. There's an awful lot of kind of not quite saying a thing, but maybe saying the opposite of the thing and then making, you know. So I mean, there's a lot to play with. And I think that that's how we get to know characters, it's like how they talk to one another. Do you mean the same comment? Absolutely. Absolutely. The question is about dialogue. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's totally. All, uh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's all about dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Is that? I don't know, it's great. No, no, sorry. Um, <laughs> 
You, I was listening to what you were saying, but I was I forgot last track of the question. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's just what we're like. It's about the way we speak. And oh yes. Yeah. Well, what I find is that you can move along really quickly, you know, right. uh, because uh, the thing is that I I I'm not really that interested in story as such. You know, right. that's why I wouldn't be myself personally a great fan of writing short stories right. because there's a sense that you must have. It, whereas I'd much rather just get a character going, right? And that takes me time to find that and. Usually dialogue is a great way, like if you start describing people, yeah. it's different. Yeah. Once they start talking, and in the process of writing, they're talking to me, really. Mm -hmm. Then I get to know them, and I just want to see what they're up to. And it's something I've like said before, that like, if you sort of, not say that I have a good character, if you're a good character, and if they're just making a cup of tea, they be, you know, they'd, they'd, a story's going to happen there, whatever yeah. it is, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah. Um, you don't think about plot, you don't think about what's going on in the story, the character will, will take it. Which, the big one, like, so for example, like, I'd be writing uh, this novel forever, right, and I, I just take it over and over again, right, and uh, usually what I would do is, it's like a window box, like I know the start and the end, and once they're strong enough, I can go anywhere I want in between, do you know? Yes. Yeah. You know, that's how I feel. Yeah. 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 Like, and you can have as many stories as you want, you know? Sure. I got the same impression with you, Lisa, especially with, with um, the Blood Miracles, where Ryan kind of, as a character, just took it over and dominated it. I mean, that, did that happen organically, or had you planned that uh, from, from the floor of the service? I kind of knew I had more to go with him. Um, I knew I had more to go with the whole the whole thing, really, in that, you know. But I think everything kind of starts with character. If the character is strong enough, you can, you know, you worry about the plot, they'll, yeah. they'll do it themselves, you know, and I know, like, especially if you're not a writer, you think that sounds mental, if somebody says to you, like, oh, well, you know, the character, like, you just can't make them do things, they do things by themselves, and people go, well, that's not true. No, it is true. If you have a character who's strong enough, if you know them well enough, and you, you can't make them do certain things, and when I say that, I mean, you can write the scene for them, but it won't feel right. You won't be able to get to the next sentence because there'll be something that went wrong two paragraphs ago. There's some there's a sense that you're forcing the character into doing something that they wouldn't naturally do. So once you have the character, I think everything else kind of falls into place. Well, I mean, not everybody writes the same way, but just for me. So at Ryan, basically, I knew I knew where that book started, and I I knew where it ended, like yourself in your window box. And, and, and just keep piles to into it. And it's such amazing how much you can pile into it once you know the character. So I kind of just let him off and, and, and see where he went. And there was things where, you know, you'd be writing the character, he's going down this particular lane, and you're like, well, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. So you bring him back and he goes a different way again, do you know? Right. I know that sounds like that. No, no, I understand it completely. And I mean, I feel the same way and I write the same way, but when you're talking about Ryan, where, where did he come from? I mean, he's an amazing character. I think he's a great character. Um, oh, we were talking all about him. <laughs> where did he come from? I won't ask you where he's going, but where, where did he come from? Do you want to say a little bit about him then for people that don't know Ryan Cusick? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Ryan, the story of the Glory Service is Ryan is 15. He's a 15 year old young fella. And he's, he's a bit of a pup, is, is how the nice way of saying it. And he kind of gets involved in some things he shouldn't be getting involved in because he's got no guidance, really. He's got brains to burn, but he's very easily led. And then in The Blood Miracles, it starts off, he's 20 years of age, and he's getting himself into kind of deeper and deeper shit as he goes. Um, as to where he came from, I don't know. He's been in my head now for so long. And this is kind of how stories, novel stories, whatever, kind of happens for me, is that there's a character in here that's been growing, it could be just for a week, it could be for months, or in Ryan's case, years. And they're kind of hanging on there waiting for a particular story to kind of arise, or some, some, some kind of flash, it could be something I see in the street, it could be kind of an over conversation that I overhear, don't know, but something will make me go, that's their story. So honestly, he's been there, so he's probably the, the character that I've spent the longest with. I mean, Ryan probably came to me when I was the same age he was. I know twice is it? Just twice. Right. <laughs> uh, the one thing that kind of epitomizes Ryan for me, he's a walking disaster when really, you most of the book. Like you kind of say, Ryan, don't do it, don't do it. And he does it. <laughs> but at the end, he's faced with a situation where he's going to have to do something he doesn't want to do. And I, I'm not going to say a whole lot more about it, so I don't want to spoil it. But I just want to read one, one passage here. And this is in his voice. He says, I don't want to bring my kid into a city, Ryan thinks, and the thinking stuns him, without both of us in it. 
I don't want a world of regret and missing pieces. I don't want my baby to ask me, Dad, who did you lose before you found me? And I thought maybe some notes because I think Ryan isn't fighting with Dan or Purcell or Shakespeare or even Kareem or Tony's dad or anything. He's fighting himself. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 I mean, but I think that's kind of that's where the great conflict comes from in any kind of piece of literature or any kind of great character or any character that we love. You know, this is where the real bones of it come from, the real conflict, the real kind of stuff is whether or not they're happy with themselves and what they're doing, whether or not they're kind of pushing to go this particular way, whether or not their kind of ambition is bringing them somewhere and something else is stopping them, you know, whatever the inner conflict might be, that's where you get the character. Imagine writing about somebody who was completely delighted with everything they did and had no problems whatsoever. Okay, well, I mean, you could write a lovely satirical novel about that, wouldn't you? And then he trundled along and he made all the right decisions and he said to himself, God, I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> Scully, um, has he been hanging around with the back of your head for a while, or where did he come from, or why did you talk to religion? The interesting thing is, right, uh, I suppose when I was about eight years of age, I went to the man. Oh, yeah, sorry, the interesting thing is, when I was around eight years of age, that's how I guess it is. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry, okay. <laughs> Uh, when I was around eight years of age, um, I was seven, I never went to the man, and uh, two guys in my class were actually here tonight, which is quite incredible. Okay, right? Sorry to see. I'd like, I'd be quite honest with you, one thing I sort of stay away from in that book, particularly, is um, I suppose the horrific sort of other stories, right? Because um, and yet there would be, it was a, a, horrific, a horrific story in itself, right? But I just thought, you know, that there were actually, some of them were actually, well, I suppose, you know, it's the whole sort of spectrum of, of humankind really is in there, really. And um, I, you know, I have great memories of some of the Christian brothers, but I must say, looking back on it, uh, education, as I remember it, wasn't really a great experience, you know? And I think it's sort of, in a funny way, uh, that has been a spectre in my whole life. Right. The whole, I just didn't get that first 17, 18, 18 years of my life at all, at all, right? And um, um, so, yeah, I, I guess you were able to school, he's in there somewhere, but I think he's in there as one of the better guys, yeah. you know, because um, even though he's tormented, uh, but, uh, you know, not one of these evil people lurking on the background, you know, more of an innocent broad, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, that comes across in the book very much. He's a very sympathetic character, dealing with, like, you know, Brother Lynch and, and uh, the deputy and these kind of people. But all the big emotions are in there, too. You know, there's kind of the shame, the regret, the loss, the loss. Um, and, and, you, you know... But well, actually, the mad thing about that book, right, is that... I've been writing a novel since um, 1999, really, since the last one came out, and it's massive, it's thousands and thousands of pages, and um, I just thought, this is ridiculous, so I actually just cut this out of that chunk, right? And uh, so there's another bunch, actually, to, to come out of it as well, right? Uh, because I just thought that it was sort of standalone enough, mm -hmm. and uh, particularly with the theory, that there's a theory in there who Jesus' father was, right? And... Uh, I, I just thought that um, it, it probably needed to, to, to sort of to put it all in together. It would just be chaotic. So take that one out, and then the rest will. Plus the other thing is that uh, passion play, which was sort of you know flatland drugs, prostitution, all that kind of stuff. I found that this one was gone down the same road again, right? Very much so. And um, I, I I thought. No, I'm going to separate that out. And you know, you're talking about class and stuff, and it wouldn't be a conscious sort of thing about class. But I, I just thought, you know, and I don't even like working class because to me, working class sort of means unemployed, really. Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense like, uh, if you're working in grade, especially in the 80s, right? In the 90s. And um, so, uh, but that kind of sentiment, right? Um, Often it's very easy just to put them into flat, put that world into flat land of drugs and prostitution. And I, I was sort of thinking, where would you get sort of, and then once again, hate that term working class because it doesn't sort of fit, but where would you get that sentiment and yet have a whole community of people who may have 
have read a few books, might have went to college, whatever it, and obviously the Christian Brothers is an obvious place, and so it's a community, within a community of sort of working class people, because for the most part, Christian Brothers came from working class backgrounds, yeah. you know, they didn't, um, um, you know, they, they, and so that's sort of what it was, it was sort of that, that sort of background, but with a different perspective in life, you know, and a broader perspective maybe, um, yeah, so. Yeah, but, but there's that struggle as well, if I can read a little bit from the from the epilogue in this, there's a great change of point of view at the end of it. Um, and there's a character, a female character, I won't say any more, and she, this is a part of the text, she wonders what if, what if she had said what she should have said, what if she had done what she could have done, what if, and the book is all about what if really, about decisions and transgressions and the consequences of that, a bit like Ronnie Mary. There's about belief, yeah. you know, and the, the Jesus story is about belief, and I think belief really only exists if there is no proof, because if there is proof, you don't have to believe, it's there for you, and I think all beliefs are up for reassessment at all times, as new facts come into play. I, I'm not talking about great things, but like there was times when we all believed, in, well, the earth was flat, and then it sort of says, that actually, it's not. And I say, no, it is. We have to burn you to stay. And then maybe we'll come to your day and say, actually, you know what? It isn't. It's too late, right? And so, like, you just have to believe what you can believe. Um, and, like, so even the whole, the, like, so all the stories, there's a Doughty Boy story, the, the, the three guys up in No Man's Land, all that kind of stuff. None of them really. I suppose the, the thing about fiction, right? is to stretch it to the limits of plausibility, you know? And I think, I, I was only thinking recently that most biography or autobiography is pure fi fiction. And I think most fiction is actually fact stretched to the limits of plausibility. So that, that's what I'd say that is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um We've a few minutes left, but I wonder, is there anyone in the audience who would like to ask Tom, a question? Tom, you want to take a break for tea? We <laughs> <laughs> want tea, we'll be doing further stuff, do you? Um, anyone would like to ask a question? Can, can I just ask a question yeah. to Coleman there? I've I read both your books, and I'm delighted. What you just said there about taking fact to the, the, the engine, you know? Yeah. As much as you can. I take the view of people for that reason. In fact, it couldn't, couldn't be accepted in fiction. And after that, the facts that are actually got out around us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, do you know what? It's the trick is to give credibility to the fiction. So, like, for example, if, if I said to you that uh, I saw a fellow coming down Patrick's Hill on a bicycle at 100 miles an hour, you can see, all right. Or if I said he came down to 98 miles an hour, there'd be some of plausibility in that because <laughs> there's a bit of detail. Jeez, 98 miles an hour, yeah, you know, like, there's, a, there's a bit of facts thrown in there. I find the speed. Like. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, I knew a guy who came out of the in a, he was a name, actually, in a boxcar. And uh, he was actually a great guy, but he was uh, prone to sort of exaggeration. And he made a boxcar and he had a wooden hand on the side of it. He said it would stop him on Patrick's head. <laughs> so he said, okay, up we go, right? And um, so it came off, but I think it's in I think the break was a uh, cash as well, though. There's no way down across Patrick's head. See, that's the name of the plausibility, you can believe me. I know, he actually hit the carpet bottom and went up over the bridge. <laughs> Sorry. Anybody else got a question about speed, maybe? <laughs> no? Uh, no, anyone? I have one other question for the two of you. Um, it's about the short story. We say you are adamant that you can't write short stories, that you're not going to write short, short story. Will you, will you explain that to us? Because a lot of people disagree with that. They're very hard, like, they're very hard. And I know an actual short story reader, I kind of, I mean, all the, what I was saying there about characters and dialogue and all this kind of stuff, that kind of experimentation with characters is much more at home in the long form. Um, with the, the short story, you have a situation where you can't waste a word. You have to have it feeling like a complete thing, its own thing. 
And at the same time, you have to have this, this cool trick where even though you read this contained world, you have to be completely, you have to make the reader completely believe that there is a whole other world operating outside it, that this is just one moment that you have captured in a short story, but that, you know, there's a world operating around it too. And it's just, it's really bloody difficult. And I find I have to kind of wrestle with short stories quite a bit. I've never really been happy with any of them that I've written. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, yeah, some of us, I think, are natural short story writers and some of us aren't. But I have a friend who's a short story writer who um, also goes from relationship to relationship um, <laughs> quite bounces around. And I, I put it to this person that um, that was because they were a short story writer. They have no attention span. I, so I met my husband when I was 19. And I'm just like to say that I'm obviously a novelist, you know. <laughs> Fidelity, loyalty, all of these good qualities. Are you happy about the short story, Colin, do you think? Uh, I, I think, I said, writing short stories, you know, even a novel, it's all sort of episodic stuff. Okay. And, uh, like, um, but they don't end, so you don't get a chunk of what you find is that they, they, they end up sort of feeding through. So you get a start somewhere on, start somewhere and then another bit later on, another bit later on. And uh, in fact, the reason, there was a reason I did that for the first one. And I find it's the way I do it now. It's because uh, Passion Play is uh, structured on the gospel. Right? The, the, but like if you look at the four gospels, they're all the same, like whereby um, the first three quarters are is totally episodic and you're introduced to all these characters and then in the full Gospels from, from the moment really that Jesus arrives into Bethany, just it's minute by minute by minute by minute until he's crucified and goes to heaven, whatever, right? And like all the episodic pieces you meet are on, right? They're sort of fed back into the last third, right? And uh, so I sort of really enjoyed and that would pass me and it's sort of a style I sort of got into that mm -hmm. you can sort of, you know, introduce someone and if you do something big enough, you can pick them up again later on and it sort of strings it along a bit and then the, the end, even at this one, it's like the clock is ticking and you just run to the end. You know, for me, the moment he decides to leave the bedroom yeah. after 50 years or however long he was in there. Yeah. Was he, he must be starving, was he? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, no, he left after 50 years and said he'd go out and um, that, then from that moment on, there's no backflash or there's no forward flash. It's like by the moment and it's the same thing, you know. Um, so in between that, it's all short stories, sort of put and paste together, you know? Yeah. Sure. And, and are you going to continue with Brother Scully or some other brothers? Or? Well, the interesting, not the interesting, there's not a bit to do with Jesus. There's so many interesting things in the world besides that. But <laughs> the thing is that um, there's a character in Pashby called Fatfucker, right? Yeah. And Fatfucker yeah. was like... Uh, uh, how are you going to translate that to Chinese? I was thinking... Well, I tell you, the man, this isn't being filmed, is it? Uh, I hope not, because uh, I, I had a... Uh, this thing translated into, not this one, but into Chinese, right? And uh, I got an email back, and it was all very straightforward. One of them was, um, what does I will in the whole mean, right? <laughs> and I said, I, I said, it means that, because <laughs> it was email, right? And I was trying to keep it really simple, right? So I said, I can't get to how you get an answer. It means I will in my whole, right? <laughs> and then she was saying, uh, you will what in your own? <laughs> I said, I will nothing in my own. I said, it means that I won't do it in your own. Right? <laughs> it was ridiculous, right? And it better sense, right? And I think it's used the embarrassment. Uh, I don't know how to translate it because I can't read Chinese, but I'm sure it was fine. <laughs> So, no, I tell you, Fat Fucker, basically, uh, there's a brother in that, uh, I can't even know his name, uh, he's, a, uh, he's the guy who leaves, right? right yeah. And he says the exact same thing that Fat Fucker says, right? Yeah. And uh, Fat Fucker in Passion Play sort of had a gay sort of thing when he yeah. came out and yeah. then he sort of got married, he wasn't sure. And he was the, he left um, Crowley. Or probably yeah, he, uh, Fat Fucker was Pat Crowley's son, right? Right, right? And so that's, so they're not linked except for that. And then in the next one, Mossy the Gardener appears right. very big, but not. Who's in love with Sister Francesca? 
Crazy that part of the truth. The spelling was so bad, like Francesca. Oh, you spell Francesca all over. So something for that. Lisa, can you do you want to talk about what's what's happening next or Brian? I'm retiring. Yeah. No, I, I just actually handed in the, the delivered this is the parents of the third novel today. So today. I don't want to tell you that my editor hated it, you know. Um, so, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd like to mind the fat fucker, or Ryan the fucker, who's causing you all that misery. Ah, uh, I miss him, actually. Yeah, I miss him. Yeah, I killed him. <laughs> 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 Any, anybody want to ask one last question before we wrap it up? Okay, we have one here. Yeah, I'll start. Um, I just, uh, I... Everybody always talks about Ryan and um, uh, Lisa, and uh, but my favourite character is Kareem. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, good. And uh, so I'm just wondering. I'm hoping she has a bigger role in book three. She she gets her own voice. We actually hear from her in book three. So um, yeah. So yeah. Oh, I did that for you. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. No, I I had a great fun with her actually. Um. I, you know, I mean, Kareem doesn't really have a kind of a first person really much to do in, in either book, but well, she gets a little bit, but not an awful lot. And, you know, I was kind of worried about her coming across quite saintly, you know, um, kind of the long suffering kind of archetype. And it turns out Kareem is a petty, kind of bitchy, funny, actual real person. So, yeah, I had a lot of fun with her. I'm so glad you said, you couldn't have said that at a better time, would you? Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you the fire later. Yeah. <laughs>